One of the avenues that enlarges worshipers in heaven is through the martyrdom of saints. And that is exactly what Jesus said would be like globally in Matthew 24. If you look down, Jesus says in verse 7, For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, uh, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. What's interesting, that nation against nation is ethne, ethnic group. And, and we're seeing that type of thing going on. In fact, most of the conflicts nowadays are not so much sovereign, sovereign nations, but the whole concept of ethnic groups within sovereign nations that aren't getting along. And then it says famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. And all these, verse 8, are the beginning of sorrows. But look at verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, that hasn't quite happened. Christians are not universally hated by all nations everywhere on the face of the earth tonight. We're still accepted. Uh, love. Uh, presidents call in evangelicals for counsel in America. Uh, they still have a, a somewhat state operated Archbishop of Canterbury kind of thing over in England. They still have the Church of Scotland. They still have much of the freedoms in New Zealand and Australia. And, and there is the state church in, in a lot of the Scandinavian countries. There's not universal hatred against believers. But remember that many of Christ's saints are still suffering and dying around the world today. Persecution is as old as God's people. Saints were persecuted in the Old Testament. Remember what it says in Hebrews 11? They were stoned, they were slain, they were wandered around in goatskins and calfskins. They were sawn in sunder. So there's always been Old Testament, New Testament persecution. In fact, if you just casually read the book of Acts, those 28 chapters, you know what you come up with? 47 different specific persecution times that are recorded. 47 different accounts of the early church suffering. So persecution is not new. It's old. It's just at the very end, it's absolutely universal. We're not quite there yet. In modern times, with the unstoppable flow of news reports from every corner of the globe via the Internet, there is a growing awareness that worldwide suffering is going on among literally millions of believers who are persecuted just because they're Christians. Now, I remember the years that I delivered Bibles in Eastern Europe and and preached in churches in Eastern Europe and, and Northern Africa and the Muslim countries, it was common knowledge that if you were a Christian, you couldn't go to college. In the whole Soviet bloc, Christians didn't go to college. Because if they went to college, they'd get a degree, and then they might outdo a Communist Party person. So no higher education for Christians. Now, just try that in America. What would you think of that? What would you think if being a Christian would permanently reduce your children to day laborers and hourly workers? They could never be professionals. Well, we would have a, a lessening in the visible church in America. That's what they found in Eastern Europe. The people disassociated with the church because they wanted their children to go to college. They wanted them to succeed. They wanted them to be managers. They wanted them to be professionals. The Christians weren't allowed to be under the 70-year rule of communism. They were not allowed to be professionals. There's a great price to pay all over the world. The persecution of economic discrimination is one of the many forms that persecution took in the last hundred years. In fact, last month I was contacted online by a group of Pakistani believers. They sent me an email and, you know, in the, the interesting way it comes through, you know, where English isn't quite the way you, it kind of makes you chuckle, if you know what I mean. If you ever get an email from someone that doesn't quite know English to put the words around, that's why I only email in English, because I don't want them to laugh at my French, you know. And so I just use English. And, uh, but they communicated from Pakistan to us in English, and they sent me a note, and they said, uh, uh, we like Book Your. And I thought, yeah, I got it so far. And they said, we translate Book Your. And, uh, and so I wrote back and said, Book Your what? You know, what, what Book Your do you want? And they said, oh, can we... It translates some of the portions of, of the book that I wrote in Revelation. And I said, you certainly can. They says, uh, but you pay us for translate your book here. And I said, oh, oh, you want to be hired for translation. I said, well, we don't have any funding right now to, to translate that into Pakistani. But I said, tell me more about you. I'd love to pray for you. 
And I have their email. It's just amazing. They, they said that they are followers of Jesus Christ in Pakistan. And that is a land of great persecution against Christ's church. And so I wrote them back. I said, how exactly are you persecuted? And this is what they said. Pakistani believers face many forms of persecution, but one of the foremost is constant financial oppression. Now, is that, you read about that in the news? Financial oppression. Did you know that believers in Pakistan, born again, evangelical believers, are not allowed to own property? They can't own real estate. It's against the Muslim law for them to actually own real estate, property, homes. Now, in some of the outlying areas, but wherever there is the, the following of the law, they aren't allowed to own property, especially homes. And this is what they said. Consequently, we must rent from Muslim landlords. And our hostile landlords charge us as believers as much money for rent as they think we can possibly be earning. So we are always short on money and only have just barely enough to live on. Now again, how would you like to not own your home, live in an apartment from someone that tries to calculate how much you have and they change the rent every month? I mean, we wouldn't stand for that. We'd have another 1776 revolution, right? That's how we think. But that's how they live over there. They said this was the bottom of their of their uh, email, they said, we face hunger, endless labor, and financial insecurities. And that's just some of the daily persecutions and afflictions that your brothers and sisters face in Pakistan. So I wrote them back. I said, what did you want to translate for? They said, because they wouldn't figure out what we were doing. And if you paid us just a minimal amount, like 2 or $3 a day, we would be able to feed our family, and they couldn't figure out where the money came from. I thought, two or three dollars a day you can feed your family? We have it so good over here. Persecution is just one form of what the Bible describes as affliction. Affliction is needed because affliction in our lives was designed by God to be much like the fire of Daniel 3. Do you remember the three Hebrew boys that were made to enter the fiery furnace? By the way, what happened to them? The only thing that got burnt was the bonds that kept them from moving around. Only what bound them was burned away. And then they were able to walk around and fellowship with the Lord who was with them in the furnace. I think sometimes we need to reread that story. Because in our lives, affliction and persecution are designed by God to only burn away anything that hinders our walk with Him. So instead of running from it every time we hear about it or see it, we should realize that when God brings affliction, persecution, duress into our lives, it's for His purpose. 